All right, everybody, welcome to another Super Speed Golf webinar. We really appreciate everybody being here with us this afternoon and spending some time talking about uh, speed and power. Um, really excited today to have one of my mentors and probably one of the biggest influences on my coaching career, um, uh, Dave Phillips from TPI with us. Dave, how are you doing out in California? I'm doing good, Mike. Thanks for having me. And I uh, hope you guys are doing well, too. It's a strange times right now. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a weird, weird place. You know, I think we're all trying to find kind of what that new normal is going to be. As, as you mentioned, we were chatting before we got started here. And, you know, I think a lot of this type of stuff, the digital information age is really coming to golf in a, in a really uh, heavy way right now. I mean, we've actually seen some really cool stuff happening um, with people using our super speed stuff. We've seen some coaches doing digital speed clinics, uh, you know, all kinds of cool stuff to still get people involved with these, these kind of things. And, you know, I know you guys have been doing a lot of that cool stuff as well. So uh, definitely a different age, but, you know, also a fun time to get some audiences together and talk about all those things we're so passionate about. Absolutely. You know, today's topic that we're going to talk about is going to be really mechanics of the golf swing that really affects speed and power. And I think there's some cool information here because I think a lot of the traditional stuff that we've talked about in the golf coaching world for many, many years in some ways has been very closely designed to, you know, really maximize control in the golf swing, not necessarily maximize power all the time. And, you know, definitely now from a statistics standpoint, we know that, you know, ball speed and power, are one of the most telling elements of predictive elements of success for players all around the world. So looking now and kind of taking a, you know, dissecting a lot of those swing mechanics that really do affect speed and power and seeing we, how we can maximize that, I think is a really fun, uh, really fun topic to have this afternoon. You know, many people have seen our model that we've talked about a while for the, uh, at super speed called the speed pyramid, where we really look at how, you know, ground reaction forces and uh, rotational sequencing and lag and wrist mechanics all work together to create speed. What we want to do today is actually look inside of that even further to see some of those mechanics that produce efficient use of the ground, efficient sequencing and efficient lag and wrist mechanics. And sure. I think without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dave, and we'll go through a little bit of that information. Please remember everybody, um, if you have questions about any of this, please type it in the Q&A panel at the bottom there on Zoom. Um, my uh, partners, Kyle Shea and Mike Peck are gonna be going through those questions. They'll answer some of those right away in the chat pane. Others, uh, Dave and I will answer live right after we uh, get done with some of this information. So Dave, let's hear it. Okay, well, first of all, everybody, thanks so much for joining me. And I certainly hope you're, you and your families are healthy in this uh, strange time we live in. But let's try and be a little bit positive and kind of educate you. It's a great time to get educated right now while we're sitting at home. and. Anything you want to learn, there's probably no better time than right now to learn it and actually dig deep into it. So speed is a passion that obviously at TPI we've had for a long time. Uh, Mike and what you've done with super speed has been great in that it gives us a, a simple way. And we've used it with many players and many of our tour professionals as a way to gain speed. And there's, you know, there's lots of different ways to do it. And there's lots of ways to talk about it. I'm sure the audience is, is interested in that. What I wanted to talk to you a little bit about first was really more about swing mechanics, or as we call them at TPI, swing characteristics that can affect your ability to produce speed. And then we can kind of look at some of those and take a deep dive around them. And many of you that are golf professionals that are sitting here listening in or, or fitness or medical, you, you should know a lot of these already. And for my general public and just avid golfers that have joined us as well, some of these may be new to you. You might have some of these. And uh, I want to dig, dig a little bit deeper and, and talk to you a little bit about those. And then we can have a chat about it. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, so what I'll do is I'm just going to share my screen for a minute here, Mike, and um, I'm going to bring up a my desktop and I'm going to go to, let's see here. So I got a slideshow here. So can you guys see that? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, can you see that? Just give me a thumbs Absolutely. up. Absolutely. It looks good. Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about swing characteristics that affect speed. And we'll pick like five or six different things that we've talked about in our TPI certification classes, but also kind of a little deeper dive as to why they can affect speed and maybe kind of a little bit of knowledge about differences of opinion. There's lots of us golf coaches that agree and disagree. And I think that's what, what makes this game so great is that there's millions of ways to get the job done. We, we really don't have to disagree because 
Um, you know what? There's, there's people that defy me every day, things that I've said that I think, wow, they can't do that, and they do it. So I think in many ways, uh, it's more interesting to take a, a kind of look under the hood, and that's what we do every day at the TPI, and that is look at the body. So I want to start with the body and power and kind of a few areas of the body that to me are essential to creating speed. You know, golf is a rotary game and you've got to keep rotating. So, you know, I look at the hips and the hip structure and I look at that and, and I need mobility in my hips. You know, I need uh, mobility in my hip in order to load into my glute and use the ground effectively on the backswing. And most importantly, I need, I need lead hip mobility because if I can't post up into the lead leg, use the ground effectively and push and rotate and use that to generate force, I'm not going to maximize my speed. So that's why we look at your internal hip rotation on both sides and we kind of take a deep dive into the hip structure and that pelvic area, that's a huge proponent for creating speed and, and one that we look at every day. Now, can you still be fast with tight hips? Yes, you can, but you're gonna have to stress other areas of the body. So I kind of look at the body as this mechanism that needs certain areas to work. I think you need the hips to work to be efficient. Thoracic spine, I think that needs to be efficient. If that's not functioning, you tend to put stress on other areas of the body. And this is where most people go down with lower back pain that Mike, as you know, robs you of speed. If you're anytime you're crippled by lower back pain, you guys know, and you've probably seen Tiger Woods buckle on a tee box where he goes down underneath them. It's not fun. And a lot of time that comes from hips that aren't functioning properly and a thoracic spine that's not mobile. So what happens when you go to swing a golf club? The first thing you're going to do is you're going to use the one area that you shouldn't, and that's your lower back. And you use your lower back to turn because your hips don't and your thoracic spine don't. So all of a sudden you put all the stress in that area and eventually it just breaks. So this is why sometimes we see some players, especially younger players that have unusual characteristics, things that we look at now and say that could lead to injury. The reason we know it can lead to injury is we've done this for a long time. At TPI, we've done probably over a million people in terms of assessing golfers around the world through our uh, screening tools and through our online you know, team. I mean, there's 20, 25,000 TPI certified experts out there. And many of you that have done screens and posted them on TPI, we've tracked that data and we know. So to me, thoracic spine's got to move. If not, you're putting stress on the lumbar and the lower back. Um, shoulder, external rotation, very important. That I mean, in external rotation, the ability to rotate my shoulder so that I can shallow the club on the downswing. You know, there's people with flying elbows, but I, and that's fine, but if I can't externally rotate my shoulder, it's very difficult to shallow the club and maintain the plane coming down. So a lot of times I can be steep or I could use my legs. I can slide or hang back in order to try and get the club out in front of me. And that can be very dangerous as well because it, it puts stress on your shoulder joint, more on your wrists and so on. So most people that end up with wrist injuries in golf or elbow injuries in golf, which again can kill speed, it's often coming because the shoulders aren't functioning properly. So the stress goes somewhere else. I have to overuse my arms or overuse my wrists to square the face. And all of a sudden I get injured or I get hurt. And that's kind of one of the big areas that we look at as well. Um, supination, pronation, your forearms being able to rotate. That's a massive speed producer. If you look at the World Long Drive Tour, and when we've got them wired up to 3D, they use forearm rotation tremendously as a speed producer. Now, you don't see that as much these days on the PGA Tour because they use the ground efficiently, and they're trying to square the face to hit the ball straight and far. The long drive tour, we've got to get one ball in the grid. So those guys are trying to maximize speed from every area that they've got it. And forearm rotation is one of those. So for my higher handicap golfers or golfers looking for speed, just remember, copying a tour player's golf swing can be extremely dangerous. You have to remember what you're dealing with. These are like finely tuned race cars, Formula One machines. Their bodies function beautifully. They usually um, have great mechanics. 
and they can add speed and do things that a lot of us humanly cannot do. Don't ever forget that when you're trying to look at golf swings. It's fine to have an idol. It's fine to have somebody you love to, to emulate, but make sure that you can do it and you'll be much more effective. And then the other one I look at a lot, Mike, is the neck. So most people don't realize that the neck goes through a huge range of motion, both on the backswing and the downswing, even though the head looks still, and that's because the shoulders are rotating around the neck. And if the neck is tight, then usually what can happen is you'll stand up a loose posture. Sometimes we call that early extension. And if you lose your posture during the golf swing, anytime you stand up on loose body angles, you're not rotating. And as a result, your RPMs go down and you don't create the speed. So these are just little things we dive deep into TPI. And many of you don't know about TPI. Um, you know, we started in 2004, surrounded ourselves with 53 men and women on our advisory board that are way smarter than us. And they, they police us. So when we come up with ideas, we test it through that group. And they come back to us and let us know, hey, you should look harder at this or, you, should, you know, you're, you're doing well or so on and so forth. So we've been doing this for a long time, looking at the body in relation to the swing. I'm proud of, of what our TPI certification has done and how many great golf professionals are out there using this information. But the biggest thing I want you to know is, is build a swing around the way you move and you'll be much more efficient and you'll produce your maximum speed. If you're trying to build a golf swing based on knowledge that, hey, I've got to use the ground, but you can't physically do it, you're liable to put yourself at injury trying. And that's very, very important. And Mike, you know that as good as anybody in your speed clinics and so on and so forth. Um, so let's take a little dive now into just some little model of the human body. And we use this in our level one classes. And I love this model for describing the human body. And that is the body works in alternating segments of stable and mobile joints. So what we mean by that is the foot, your foot has an arch in it and that creates stability. If we lose that arch and we have a flat foot, we're no longer quite as stable. We want a stable foot, right? So this is why a shoe is very important. Arches or arch supports in the shoe can be very important. And the kind of shoe you use for speed can be very important. And I think a lot of us don't take that into consideration. We buy a shoe for comfort and for looks. We don't necessarily buy a shoe for speed. But your foot is the one thing attached to the ground. And if you really want to maximize your speed, you need to make sure you have the right shoe that fits you correctly and it fits your shape of your foot. That's extremely important. If it's too narrow, try bringing your toes in and try and be stable and swinging. It's not very good open your toes up, all of a sudden it activates your glutes, you have a much more stable base and you can use the ground more effectively. So very important that you look at the shoe. So going down along this model here, the foot needs to be stable, ankle needs to be mobile, and we call a mobile joint something that moves really good in three planes of motion. We call a stable joint something that can move in three planes, but it's usually good at moving in one plane of motion, like the knee. So for instance, the knee, does a really good job of doing this, right? It doesn't really like to go sideways very much. That's where most injuries occur on a soccer field or whatever is because the knee goes sideways and we blow the ACL. So that's why in the golf swing, any kind of lateral shearing, any kind of too much movement side to side can create shear in the knee. And we do get some knee injuries from golf because of that. So again, I look at the next joint, that would be the hip. The hip needs to be mobile. That's why I talked about this earlier in that I want those hips mobile so that I can load and rotate and use the ground most effectively. Lower back should be stable. The facet joints or joints of the lower back, they don't need to rotate that much. That's why when players do have lower back injuries, a lot of times they can recover. And as long as they maintain mobility in their thoracic spine, the next joint and that hip, we can take stress off that lower back. That's why Tiger at four back surgeries. I mean, let's face it, his back now is fused his lower back, so he isn't moving at all, and he's still able to function really well. But when Tiger will go down is if he loses thoracic spine rotation and loses his hip mobility. So two huge areas that I know that he needs to keep working on, and I know he is in order to take the stress off that lower back that he has. And as I move forward, as I said, this is an alternating pattern, stable segments connected to mobile joints throughout the body. So why is this important? Well, if for some reason one of these is dysfunctional, say your hip is tight, then all of a sudden when you go to swing, 
and your body goes, okay, I know you want to move, but that hip's not really good. Well, maybe we get it from the knee, which the knee doesn't like to do that. So that can create some stress. Or maybe we'll use the lumbar or the lower back, and that doesn't like to rotate. So that can create some stress. So when we're with TPI and when we're looking at players and building programs for elite tour players or training our TPI certified community, this is what we go on. We try and build exercise programming around keeping that model functioning. And if you can keep it functioning throughout your life, you can maintain your speed and you can do a lot of cool things. And that's a big, big factor, as you know, Mike. So yeah, absolutely. now I'm talking a little bit. You want to jump in for a second? Or, well, you're going to let me go. I, no, it's all good. I mean, I think this stuff is incredibly important. Dave. Like, you know, and I think you made one comment there that, you know, as we get into looking at the actual like swing, it's incredibly important to realize that not every golf swing is exactly the same. In fact, the most efficient golf swing for you as an individual is very much based on the way your body works. Um, so again, yeah, not trying to make your swing like everybody else's in the world or what you see on tour um, is really important. You gotta find what's gonna be the most efficient for you that's gonna produce the best speed in your case. And I think that segues really well into some of the, let's say, it's gonna seem a little more non-traditional, some of the things we may recommend to maximize your speed output. Oh, no, you're exactly right. So, so let's dig now into some of these characteristics that can rob you on speed, and then we'll open up the community and let them chat a little bit as well. So let's talk about postures, right? So there's what we call three kind of postures we look at. We have the neutral posture, which is here on the left-hand side of the screen, what we call an S posture, which has more curvature in the lower back, and then more of a C, a rounded upper back posture. Can you play with all of these? Of course you can. Can you be good with all of these? Of course you can. There are players that do it. But there are a couple of these that put more stress on other areas of the body. So what we generally see on the PGA Tour, if you look at a top 100 on the tour, you're going to see more of the one on the left, more of a neutral posture where players are more athletic looking. They may be hinged from their hips. They're from their tailbone to the middle of their back is pretty flat. And then based on balance, they're going to find their balance. And balance can look a little different because of things like leg length, torso length. Some of us have long legs, short torso. Some of us have longer arms. Some of us have smaller feet, but we're tall. So we need to feel a little bit more maybe uh, stable and more back on our heels. So you're always going to get these variations in posture. And that's fine. But there are a couple here, the next to the S posture and the C posture, that I need to talk about. And that is, if you look at the S posture where we have a lot of curve in that lower back area, well, this is a great position to be in if I was lifting something vertically. If you were gonna lift the weight off the ground, it's great. But if you arch your pelvis like that and try and rotate, and those of you that are sitting at home or you wanna get up and try and stand this, try this, just simply tuck your pelvis as if you're dumping a bucket of water out and try and rotate, you're gonna notice very quickly that there's some tension in your lower back. That's because you're putting stress on that area. And then that one, what it does is because golf is a rotary game and to maximize your speed, which is why we're all here, if I'm in that position, I'm usually gonna to have to come out of it somewhere during the swing, which means I gotta stand up. And anytime I start to get vertical, I'm not rotating. So as a result, I'm usually lifting up and down. And that can rob us of speed. So then we move down to the other one, which is our C posture. And we see more players be effective in this posture. In fact, there's some coaching styles that like you to be in this posture. The difference with this one is sometimes when I round my upper spine like that, that can inhibit my thoracic rotation. So remember that model I told you about earlier where I want that thoracic spine to move. So if you're just sitting there, if you round your upper back as much as you can, pull your shoulders in and try and turn a little bit, you're going to feel a lot more restricted than if you were shoulders back and rotating. So it can affect your ability to rotate. And if it does, usually what happens, you'll stand up, you'll go vertical. Now, sometimes going vertical can get my arms up higher. I can get more speed when my arms are up higher. So some people will start in this posture. As they rotate, they will stand up and then they will recover. There's always recoveries. There's always people that can recover from poor positions like poor postures. And there's lots of different postures. My big thing with posture is it needs to be balanced. 
It needs to be put in a position that allows you to continue your rotation as efficient as possible. Have I tore players in S posture, C, and neutral? Yes, I have. But I've also tested them physically to see whether those positions are affecting their ability to produce speed and power. And that's the difference. So any of those three will work. You generally see more tour players with the neutral posture. S posture, I'm not a big fan of because it does tend to put more stress on the lower back and I don't like that. C posture, lots of guys that do that. If you're more of a one plane swinger, that's more effective than if you get your arms up because you'll stand up. But nonetheless, those are postures. Um, let's talk about a big one now. And, and Mike, you've heard me talk about this one a lot. And that is something we call early extension. Um, I don't know whether we coined the phrase. We've been talking about it since 1996 is when Greg and I yeah. first got together chatting about extending in the, in the golf swing. And let's get this straight. Everybody has extension. Nobody maintains their body angles during the golf swing. It's impossible. On the 3D, you're constantly in the state of flexion, extension, rotation, and side bend left and right. So if we were look on a 3D system, angles are constantly changing. When we're looking at a video camera, a lot of times we're just, you know, looking at two dimensions and we can look like we stay in posture extremely well. Although the angles are constantly changing, it looks like that. The killer for me is what we call early extension. And that is if you take your golf swing from kind of a down the target line view and you simply draw a line on somebody's tailbone, then basically what will happen is because the hips are elliptical in shape, they're not a circle, if you rotate effectively, your right butt cheek should go behind that line. And then in transition, as you're shifting your pressure back to your lead foot, your hips shouldn't rapidly unwind. Basically what happens is your lead side moves away from your trail side. That's that kind of Sam Sneed squat that's spreading the ground feel. And that will put your pressure back into your lead side. That isn't your butt going up underneath you. And that creates what we call space. And if you can create space, then you can do anything you want with your arms and your club. So if the club face is slightly shut, slightly open or cupped coming down, you can still be a very effective golfer if you don't early extend. But if you stand up early in the golf swing, then what happens is it kills your rotation, your body gets in the way of where your arms are trying to go, and as a result, you usually have to release the angles in your wrists early, and that can cause a lot of issues, as you know, because you're going to lose speed and lose power. So early extension would be this person here on the left, where you can see the original tailbone line was on their, on their butted address, and they've moved significantly closer to the golf ball. As a result, they've still hit the golf ball, but the shaft has raised quite a bit. And a lot of these players will get fit for golf clubs and clubs that are upright. So if anytime you get fit for clubs that are upright, that will help you hit the ball more solid. It won't help you hit the ball more accurately, um, but it'll help you strike it more in the center of the face. But that stops your rotation. So the more rotary golfers, they tend to be the more powerful ones. And as you can see here, here's, here's a, a, a tour player where look at his butt is well behind that line. And if we look at some other players, you'll notice that. So I have an analogy that I use and I call it space. If you wanna have speed, power, accuracy, and consistency in the golf swing, um, you need to create space. So again, that's an acronym for speed, power, accuracy, consistency, and efficiency. Speed, power, accuracy, consistency, and efficiency. If you wanna have that in your golf swing, you gotta find a way to move those hips underneath you not in towards the golf ball. If you can do that, you can have all those things. And there's a, a great video online. This was the guys from AMG that do uh, a lot of their 3D. This is their video that I took from YouTube. And if you just look at the tailbone here, if we look down here, right here, watch how this moves backwards. So notice in transition how the pelvis is moving back and underneath you, not in towards the golf ball. So I'll let that run one more time so that you can see. If you look here, this line represents the tailbone line that I draw from a down the line view. If you watch the right butt cheek here on this player, it moves back behind this tailbone line. So at the top of the backswing, they're loading their glute, they're into their heel. As they shift laterally, notice how their butt is staying behind the line. And this center dot right here looks like it's moving at a 45 degree angle back behind them. So as they move back and they come down, 
they've cleared space. They've created space for their arms. And now they can retain their angles that they have in their wrist until they want to release them and right through to the, the, the finished position here. And this is, a, this is a great little video that I love because it shows kind of the look, look. So here's Dustin Johnson. Look at his butt behind the line. Look how he's not only one of the longest drivers on tour, but he's also one of the most accurate for his speed. And at no time does his tailbone leave that line until well after the ball has gone when he stands up. So that's when he extends through. So again, this is another Dustin Johnson creating space. The other one I like to look at at this angle is if you just look at his belt, if I take him to the top, look at his belt buckle, it doesn't ever encroach the ball. It doesn't ever move forward towards the ball. If we look at Brooks Kepka here, notice how his butt moves back behind the line. In transition, as the club comes down, it's behind. And even through when he extends and pushes against the ground, you never see daylight between him and that line. Start looking at that on your own golf swing. Start looking at that at the best players in the world. They don't come off that line. And that's a, that's a key component to creating space. So that's my little space spiel. Uh, we can come back and discuss that. I'm going to go through some of these other ones that obviously create issues with rotary force and speed. Over the top. Now, over the top, you are actually rotating. The problem is, is you're rotating the upper body um, either with the lower body. That's why the club is coming over the top and you're getting steep. And as a result, that steeper angle of attack, there are some players that actually get a little bit over the top. And there's some tour players that early extend. Most of the ones that do early extend, they early extend because they're a little over the top. So because they're a little over, they'll use the pelvis to try and shallow the club. They tend to be faders of the golf ball. Those, those players that do that, they tend to like a fade, not a draw pattern um, if they're effective. If they do have early extension, they tend to hit a block and a hook. And you got two misses on the tour. That's not going to work very well. Okay, so over the top is another one that kills your ability to use your lower body effectively. Your trunk tends to get out in front of the lower body. And then from there, you start to back out of the shot and release your wrist angles early. So another reason I don't like it, that's another characteristic that robs you of speed. So here's a, a pattern here that you see a lot of the time with the amateur on the left where the club is above that, what we call slot line, and where the, the better player is dropping it more into the slot line. Now, are there players that do both? Yes, as I said, these are characteristics. I don't really call them faults. There are good players that come over the top, generally not severely over the top, usually just a little bit above the plane line, not as much as our student here over on the left. But those would rob me of speed, of creating, creating speed. The other one would be too much lateral slide. So anytime that my hips are moving laterally, I'm not rotating and it's creating side bend. Now, this gets back to old school golf because when I grew up playing golf, watching Jack Nicholas and Tom Weisskopf and Tom Watson, they drove their legs like crazy. And a lot of them had a lot of lateral slides. So they created side bend, right? Now you have to go back to equipment a little bit. And this is why it's very difficult for you to go back to some of these old swings. I love looking at Sam Snead and Ben Hogan swings. In fact, I was just looking at digitally remastered Sam Snead and Jack Nicholas Shell's Wonderful World of Golf at Pebble Beach. If you haven't watched that, you need to go on YouTube. It's on YouTube. It's fantastic. It's been digitally redone. And there's some great slow motion footage of Jack in his 20s and of Sam Snead. And again, beautiful motions. The one thing that strikes me so well with both of those guys is Jack uses his legs to create speed. Watch the way he uses and how big of his hip turn is and how he lifts that lead heel off the ground and then replants it beautifully. Sam Snead, he does a little bit of that, not as much as Jack on the back. So he might straighten his right leg a little bit more. But the one thing he does do so beautifully is he spreads the ground. His lead side moves away from his trail side beautifully. And there's a lot of biomechanics around that discussed today about something called the moment on. And that is like gold for us in the biomechanics space. We love looking at that stuff and looking at swings like Sam Snead. When we talk about lateral slide and we look at the Johnny Millers of this world that were incredible golfers and the Tom Watsons that have played great forever, you have to understand where they developed their pattern from and why. And a lot of that can be actually traced back to equipment the persimmon-headed drivers of the day, if any of you are watching use them, 
the center of, uh, first of all, the club was tiny. The center of mass of those clubs was way up against the face. A lot of those drivers wanted to shut down and hook because of where the center of mass was. And to stop them hooking, a lot of us would drive our legs, create side bend, and drive the club down the target line to stop the ball from going left. And that's a lot of how those swings were developed. Now, a lot of those players from that era, if you actually go back and look at them, which we have, the Tom Watsons, the Jack Nicholas, both have had hip replacements, both have had more injuries than people want to talk about because we just didn't have the technology then. But when you actually look and, and talk to them, they were injured quite a bit. And um, they did have back injuries and they did have hip injuries because of things like lateral sliding. So you can get injuries from anywhere in golf if you're trying to swing with a body that's dysfunctional. That's why back to my first slides, we want the body to be functional, then you can swing any way you want. Adam Scott is the one guy we've tested that is perfect on every screen. He can swing whatever way he wants. Um, so if, if not, you're usually gonna use something else. So some of those swings were derived because of equipment. Some of them were derived because of that's how those players needed to move to shift their low point in front of the golf ball. So all of these things, they kind of live in this world. We see lots of different swings today, lots of different methods, but lateral slide will rob you of rotary speed. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, hanging back, it's probably one of the other big ones. And then I think I'm done and I'll, I'll let us open this up. But anytime I'm not shifting, I'm not moving my low point or my pressure into my lead side, then usually I'm hanging back. When I'm hanging back on my trail leg, that can pose an issue because it tends to create side tilt, the arms separate and move away from the body. Now, there are players today that we would classify as hanging back with the driver a little bit for the simple reason that the ball is on a tee and launch monitor data shows us that we want an attack angle that's moving up. There are quite a few players that are pushing so hard with their lead leg, their lead shoulders moving up and back. And as they do that, the handle comes in and they can hit up on the golf ball. And they tend to look like they're hanging back a little bit, not a lot, just a little bit. So I think that's about it in terms of talking about swing characteristics and the ones that I see most that cause you to hang back. So I'm, I'm gonna end this and we'll just get back to uh, um, not sharing here. Let me see. Yeah, awesome, Dave, thank you very much. I think those are some really, really good ones. You know, I mean, we're coming from the world, uh, especially Kyle and I from, you know, having run an academy for years that, that dealt mainly with amateur golfers as opposed to a lot of tour players. And, you know, I think a, a interesting point here is that, you know, we regularly saw people would come in with all of those different types of swing characteristics. The question is, is whether that was something we'd actually want to change for that player. You know, things like early extension, for example, are somewhat physically demanding to be able to do that um, and maintain, you know, that per that kind of, let's say, optimal position of, of no early extension. So sometimes, you know, even if you can't get yourself to that, you know, let's call it, you know, optimal position that we were looking at there, we can still find ways to maximize your speed and power and get around those or to help you, you know, increase range of motion or flexibility or whatever it might be that's causing you to not be able to do those positions. I, absolutely, you know, and, and this, this is the beauty of this game. I mean, I, I love seeing golf swings that are unusual. You know that. I mean, I love the Matt Wolfs of this world. I love the techniques that are unusual because one, they make me a better teacher by going, wow, I didn't think you could do that, but look how good that guy is doing that. So it makes me interested and stay interested in this game. What I've always been down the road of though is, you know, when you look at golfers that are extremely efficient by looking at 3D data and their bodies usually match what they're doing perfectly, they're not fighting it. I think we're in a world today with technology and things like that where we can break down golf swings. I mean, if you look at that old Shell's wonderful world of golf, I'm sure Sam Snead and Jack Nicholas weren't whipping out the video camera and trying to look at their golf swings because they look, uninhibited to me. And I think most amateurs are looking at freeze frames, stop photography, high speed videos. They're looking at positions and that can be extremely da dangerous when you're trying to create speed because speed, and this is what the beautiful thing about super speed is, is that we're not trying to hit anything per se. We're just trying to find how can I maximize that speed number by using my body. And, and I would suggest all of you try this in that 
you know, lift the heel up, see if you can get more speed, bend the arm, sit into your legs, stand up, see which one adds more speed for you. And it's uninhibited. You're not thinking about squaring a face and hitting at an object. You're thinking about swinging through an object. And I think that's very important if you're going to try and take the super speed training to the golf course is that you recognize that fact and train for that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the absolute backbones of what we've done with super speed is to try to get players to feel their golf swing as one big athletic motion, as opposed to being a sum of a bunch of little parts. And, and that's something that we saw in, in our academies that when we could get players that could think less about the details of their swing and more about the overall athletic motion and the sequencing of the, that entire motion, uh, we always saw better results. That's definitely something that's in all of our super speed protocols 100%. So um, Mike, Kyle, we, it looks like we got some questions. We wanna, anything we wanna cover? Sure thing. And just a friendly reminder for anybody that does have a question, if they do want to ask Dave a question or Mike to type it in the Q&A panel in the Zoom meeting link. So at the bottom of the screen, there is a Q&A panel and you can ask us questions there. The first question I have uh, is a little bit of a kind of a combination of questions from several people about early extension, Dave. A lot of people are interested on how you tend to uh, quote unquote treat it and some of the exercises that you kind of put in play with your uh, players. Yeah, so um, I think early extension twofold. First thing I do is I screen them, right? So to me, there's a couple of key indicators as to whether you can actually rotate and stay in posture. One is something we call a pelvic tilt and that is you know, getting in your five iron posture and having your ability to actually tilt your pelvis backwards and forwards as if you've got a bucket of water and you're pouring the water out of the bucket and you're pouring the water um, behind you, out, back out of the bucket. Pelvic tilt is a huge one in determining whether you can actually do this because believe it or not, the pelvis goes through this motion while it's rotating in the golf swing. And if you can't do that, a lot of times you will come out of your posture. So I look at pelvic tilt. I look at internal external hip rotation to see if those are functioning because that's going to stop me from rotating. And I look at something we call the overhead deep squat test, which shows me the dorsiflexion of your ankle, the range of motion in your knee, the range of motion in your hip, even your thoracic spine and your shoulders. If I was going to do one test, it would be an overhead deep squat. And this is where our TPI community, for those of you who don't know, if you go on mytpi.com, punch in your zip code, there's a ton of our people out there that can take you through a full physical assessment screen to see how your body is affecting your golf swing. Now, let's get to the golf swing. There's a couple of two couple of ways to handle this. Um, you can go after the trunk. So actually going after the part above it, if I think about my chest down and feel like on the downswing that I'm keeping my chest or my buttons down, that will usually push the pelvis back underneath you because if the pelvis is moving in, the chest is standing up to keep you in balance. Otherwise you'd fall over. So sometimes just working something like, hey, you know, right shoulder, trying to feel like my right shoulder stays back and down at the golf ball, that'll get my chest a little bit more open. That'll usually keep my hips a little bit more back. One of the biggest ones I found is if the rotation is good on the backswing and they load well on the hip on the backswing, the best one is feeling that separation kind of the Sam Snead squat. So that would be, and you can try this, is lift your heel off the ground, make a, a good backswing pivot. And then I want you, in fact, you know what? I'll stand up, I'll move back, I'll show you. So I'm gonna stand up here. You, some of you can see me there, I know there's a little bit. So what I would do is I would move back like this. I would keep this trail leg where it is, and I feel like I'm moving this side, this side, my, my lead side, away from me. And that is that feeling of that Sam Snead squat. That from down the line, that will make the belt buckle feel like it's going back behind me, which gets my chest down, gets me space for my arms to get back in front of me. There are a ton of drills on the MyTPI site. So if you go to mytpi.com, go in the swing and drills exercise and just type in early extension. I've probably got about 20 or 30 drills on early extension in there. There's even adjacent exercises there as well that will help you attack that one as well. 
Yeah, it, it's a it's definitely a physically demanding movement. So I mean, we, yes. we definitely a lot of the amateur players that we saw come into our academies, we would screen them just like that, and and some of them couldn't do some of those things, and therefore, you know, I'm not necessarily expecting a perfect scenario of them. There might be a little bit of early extension here and there in their swing. Then mm -hmm. our goal would be to stabilize that in as best way as possible. I mean. Think of early extension in a big picture as a compensation for something. You know, like the reason the player's hips are moving in toward the ball is a compensation for something. Either it's mobility that they don't have physically, or it could even be something if they, they do, if they physically could do it, then it can get into things about where they're pressing in the ground that can compensate with early extension, or even where the club is around the transition of the swing. If it gets too far behind them or too far over them, sometimes early extension is used uh, by those players subconsciously to really get the club back on path or where they want it. So a lot well, of yeah, No, you're right. And listen, so rotating the hips is a big factor there, right? So if I do have poor internal hip rotation and then someone's trying to rotate their hips or spin their hips, you can actually do some damage if you're not careful. So you, you, you have to try and restore the mobility pieces of the body if you can. And if you can't, can you live with early extension? Yes, you can. You just want to minimize it as much as possible, Absolutely. understand what it's going to do and play it. There's a lot of players that have physical characteristics that they can't fix. And this is where great coaches come in. Great coaches have a toolbox of different ways, different swing styles that you can do that make it easy for you. What we're always trying to do is I'm trying to understand how you move really more for me than for you. I want to know how you move. So I never tell you to do something that you can't do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, next question also on different uh, swing mechanics would be around um, basically inability for the spine to move. Are there any tips and tricks for people that either suffer with, you know, uh, lumbar or thoracic uh, mobility issues? Yeah, so first of all, I mean, listen, if, if, if you've got issues with your spine, obviously golf's not great for you. <laughs> it's not the greatest thing in the world. Will I tell you to stop playing golf? Absolutely not. I had an 80-year-old man come and take a lesson from me that had multiple spinal surgeries that literally couldn't move. But the one thing he did do really well is these. His arms, his forearm rotation, his wrists were beautiful. So what I could do from there is look at a different way to get him to swing where he was using his levers a little bit more and make him understand that. So the big thing is, is understand what you can do and build your swing around that. Now, would I say don't listen to a therapist or whatever? No, I would always still be trying to get treatment to try and increase mobility if I could. And this is the one thing, kind of a point of reference for us. You should be doing mobility training for about for the percentage of every decade of your life. So for instance, if you're 50 years old, 50% of your workout should be mobility. Okay, if you're 60, 60%. If you're 70, 70%. You should be making sure you're mobile. And for the younger players that are working on strength and power and working out in the gym, remember, you can only use that if you maintain your mobility. So there are a lot of guys that look huge and they come to the driving range and they can't coordinate what they've got and they can't hit the golf ball very far but they're big and they can lift a house in the gym. That's usually because they've lost their mobility. So if I can take the two and make them work together, now I've got a rocket. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of different things that happen there too when you're talking about the spine. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why you might lose some range of motion in your spine. Sometimes it's not pain. Sometimes it could be postural. There's a lot of different things. You know, Dave yeah. talks a lot about, you know, finding – uh, finding these professionals, especially the TPI certified professionals in your area, the great thing they also have is they generally have a team of fitness and medical people around them that can also help you with some of those aspects. I mean, That's right. and I think this is another interesting point that we could actually look at real quick. I think this is kind of fun. Um, you know, we talk about neurological changes with, uh, with speed training all the time, where you see jumps and speed gains right after doing our training with super speed, you can, there's a lot of times that maybe a limitation in mobility that you have in the way your thoracic spine moves could actually be your brain just putting a limiter on your body a little bit, and you actually do have that range of motion, your brain's just not letting you do it. And everybody could actually try this too real quick. If you just sit up in your chair and kind of put your feet together and cross your arms across your chest, just rotate to the side as far as you can and see how far that goes. Then do it again, take a huge deep breath, and then as you breathe out, try to turn a little further. 
and then do it again, another deep breath. And then when you breathe out, go a little further. And what you'll find is you do three or four of those, you may have just gained five or six degrees of rotation, you know, in the trunk of your body in just a couple minutes. You know, so there's a lot of those type of things that are out there that can help you with this extremely fast if you just know what to do and you know how to, uh, you find a professional that can really walk you through that process. Well, that's very true. I mean, breathing is a big factor that we look at. And even, you know, this is why, you know, golf is, is that sport where there's a, a you know, a, a time between one shot and another. If you actually think about your breathing and, and employ some of the breathing mechanisms, when you get up to your next shot, you can actually maintain your movement. So breathing can restrict your rib cage a lot. And if your rib cage is restricted, if you're more of a chest breather, you usually got a restricted rib cage. That's going to inhibit your thoracic rotation. So the more I can use my diaphragm and do belly breathing, you can look up something called box breathing, which is like a four second breath in, a four second hold and a four second breath out. Doing stuff like that is huge for maintaining mobility in your spine and in your thoracic spine. And sometimes only takes a couple minutes a day and it can really make a big difference in, in, in your overall mobility. So yeah. yeah, great question though. Perfect. Thanks guys. I'm uh, going to switch gears slightly here. We've had a lot of questions about professionals. So uh, Dave specifically, you know, for players that are a little bit smaller in stature, what are some of the mechanics that really help them such as a Rory be able to hit the ball so far? That's a great question. I think we all uh, we all love to talk about Rory. Um, you know, we we're fortunate to to be able to watch Rory when he was younger. He he was on the Titleist staff originally, and we took 3D data of him and had him at TPI when he was 17, 18, 19 years old. And you know, at that time, he was actually putting quite a bit of stress on his lower spine. And you might have recognized he had a almost like a rebound of the lower spine because of how fast he was firing his hips. Um, one of the things with shorter players or smaller players, not as big in stature, the, the, the Justin Thomases of the world, um, the Roy's of the world, they tend to be, first of all, they tend to be extremely efficient. So and usually their kinematic sequence or their 3D sequences are very good. They're using their parts extremely well. So lower body, core, arms, club, very effectively. The other thing we usually see is they load the ground extremely well. So the pressure and the force they're putting into the ground is exceptional. Um, Rory is still to this day the fastest hip speed we've ever tested of any golfer, including World Long Drive Tour golfers. But that doesn't mean rotary speed. That means how quickly he shifts into his lead foot. So he gets to the top of his backswing and he makes a very quick shift and push down into the ground. And remember, whatever force you're applying into the ground pushes back. So when he makes that shift into that lead leg, the ground pushes back, that triggers the straightening of the lead leg and the rotary force that he gets. So if you're not that big in stature, you really want to use the ground effectively. And um, I would suggest, you know, leg strength, make sure you're moving your feet. I, I think a lot of players today think that Oh, tour players are very stable in their lower bodies and their platforms are stable. That's out of necessity. They're trying to hit the ball straight as much as they're trying to hit it far. It's not just far, far, far all the time. So, you know, stabilizing their lower body stops their low point from moving all over the place and they tend to be extremely good with their strike. Now they still hit it far because their mechanics are so good and they're professional athletes, it's what they do. But for you at home, you want to move. You don't want to stay stable with your lower body. I want that lead foot coming off the ground. I want as big a hip turn as I can get because that's going to help trigger the right process coming down to maximize your speed. So I would say more than anything, when I look at the, the guys that bomb it that are shorter in stature, they tend to use the ground extremely effectively. Yeah, I agree. I think that's an excellent answer there. Mike, what, or what else we got? Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, next question uh, is for both of you. Uh, in regards to juniors, when you see swing mechanics that might be poor, for example, whether it's actually hitting a golf ball or using a super speed set, what types of uh, mechanical flaws would you step in and try to fix? And at what ages is that really appropriate to do? 
It's a good point. So, I mean, Mike, I'll answer this and you can jump in, but I mean, obviously at TPI, we have a big junior factor to what we do and we've studied kids. We have probably one of the most in-depth junior developmental platforms there is. Um, you know, from a very young age, four or five years old, we screen kids, not the same as we'd screen an adult, but we look at something called their cross crawl patterns and their dynamic movement patterns. Unfortunately, in today's world, we've gotten rid of playgrounds. Everybody thinks they should play one sport. They're not learning from all these other sports. And some of the primal movement patterns that they have aren't being developed at a young age. So we look for those first. Then when we start to look at their speed, I, it's a speed game today. So I want them to try and generate as much speed as they possibly can. I'd much rather have a kid that's jumping, extending, using the ground, and then I'll teach them how to hit it straight once they build speed. I don't want to have this perfect looking golf swing at seven or eight years old because they're probably not pushing and using the ground as effectively as they should. I would rather have it look a little sloppy, but then bomb it, even if it's a little inaccurate, and then teach them later. You know, we, we, we joke about this all the time, but I don't want the best 12 year, in, year old in the world. I want the best 21 year old in the world, right? I, I want them to develop into that world-class player if that's what they choose to do. And I think a lot of times we have these kids that are trying to model themselves after their idols. And that's not exactly what I would do as a coach. I, I would let them go. I let them go. Now, are there things that I'm worried about? Yes. If I see something like a lot of bend in the spine, a lot of twisting and turning, they can develop poor habits at that stage. And that's why you need good coaching to make sure that while they're doing this, they're developing the right motor patterns so that they don't hurt themselves as they get, get older. So if they have any specific ailments, I like them in the lightest club possible for as long as possible. I see too many nine, 10 years old with 45 inch drivers, which is crazy. I mean, that would be like a six foot tall person using a 90 inch driver. That would be nuts. You would never do that. So why do you let your kids do that? I want them as, as short and as light for as long as possible so that they develop rotary speed as fast as possible. And then we start adding length. Usually the ones that develop poor swing mechanics are because the clubs are too long, too heavy, and they're trying to balance their body with this thing that's moving around them at speed. So, yeah, no, I, I think great points there. I, I think maybe I'll answer it from a different angle a little bit on sort of the coaching inter intervention that, that would typically happen in this. And this is what I think we see that should be changed in the world of coaching is like, here, here's an example, you know, kids on the driving range hitting some golf balls, you know, maybe he tops one, maybe the ball goes to the right too much, maybe it goes to the left, whatever. Coach comes in and takes a video of the swing, says, oh, well, the backswing position's here and that's kind of weird, let's change that and try to go. You know, that seems like the logical thing to do in that environment, but it's actually, I think, very backwards to the optimal coaching strategy to help that junior. Um, I think something that works much better that we've seen would be to say, okay, you know what, I want to see you try to hit the ball out to the right. I want, to, want you to try to hit it to the left, try to hit it straight, try to hit it as far as you can. And as they start to develop the feel of what it takes to do these different types of swing mechanics that produce different ball flights, you start to see a lot of those different things actually clear up on their own without having to go through those detailed pieces of that, of that swing. You know, I definitely agree. Like if there's ever pain involved for a kid, something has to be done. Something's going wrong there, but that's yeah. probably the process didn't start real well in the first place then. I mean, what we did at our junior academies is number one, we had them hitting baseballs and hitting tennis balls and kicking and throwing. And then we had them hitting golf balls. All of those activities were developing efficient athletic motion, efficient rotational power. And then when you apply that to the golf swing, you know, the skill elements are just something you have to kind of coach around and put games involved that help that player learn those different skills. It's amazing to see though the result in after three or four weeks of doing those type of programs, you put those kids on video and it's like, wow, all of these swing mechanics look beautiful and we never talked about them at all. So I think it's, yeah. That intervention of how the coaching works is an incredibly important topic to that, that environment with juniors. Yeah, sure. We've had a lot of questions also about uh, different mechanics that different coaches might teach. For example, uh, the flying right elbow that George Genghis uh, talks about, 
Yep. Anything you could talk uh, about on that specific mechanic? Sure. Um, I, I love George Gankus. I, I love his passion. I love what he does. And I love how he challenges the, the regular golf instructor to become better. Um, the kids love him too. And I think we can all learn from that. George has a couple of uh, really cool things that he does. Um, one thing I've noticed is a lot of his plays don't early extend and that's because he gets them rotating very quickly. He tends to like, and, and I've never met George. I, I text with him once and I, I can't claim to know a lot about what he does. I have worked with some of the players that have gone to see him and um, they've told me a lot of what he does. And I've got a couple of good friends that are coached by him. Um, I know that he does like the, the, the more of a C posture. I think he likes the balance aspect of lining up the joints, which is fine. There are players that do that. Now, remember I talked earlier about thoracic rotation. If you hit a wall when you do that, then you usually have to stand up. George is all about speed. His guys get a lot of power, as you can see. And letting the elbow fly is another way to get the arms higher. So keeping it down is more keeping it around your own plane, letting the elbows fly, getting the club up and across the line. Those are all speed producers. In fact, if you look at the world long drive guys, they do a lot of that stuff. So we've coached a lot of the long drive guys and, and they do that. So the thing is, is coordinating all the pieces, right? So you have to decide if I'm gonna stand up, get my arms up in the air, squat and rotate and do that in a couple of seconds. Can I coordinate all those pieces? If you can, have at it. And there's a lot of players that go to Georgia and absolutely bomb it. I love what Matt Wolf does. He doesn't early extend. He jumps back away from the golf ball, not towards it. So he doesn't early extend. And he creates a ton of speed. It's just cool to watch him hit a golf ball. And I, I, I look at that and I'm going, those are swing methods, right? Are they for everybody? I would say probably not. I'm sure there's some people that go to Georgia and don't get better. There's people that come to me and don't get better. I like to think that I've got a different approach where I look at their body first and I try and build the right swing. And if I see somebody that I think, hey, you know, here's what George wants me to do, I test them first and go, well, let's just see if you can actually do that. Can you actually do those things? Because, you know, saying like, hey, I can get rid of early extension in one swing. Yeah, I can get rid of early extension in a couple swings too. I can get rid of anything like that. That's because I got 100 golf balls in front of me. And I'm sure pretty quickly, I can have you hit a couple on video that make it look like they're gone. The biggest difference is, can you actually take what you just learned straight to the first tee with one golf ball and out of bounds to the left and trouble to the right and hit it straight down the middle? If you can, who cares what you swing like? Who cares who your coach is? That's awesome. If you can't and you continually struggle, then you got a problem and you need to look at something else. So I, I would say that I don't mind the flying elbow. I don't mind seat posture. And I think what he's done to the game is fantastic. I love it. He's bringing more eyeballs to the game. He's making it fun for kids. And, and I'm, I'm, all, I'm his biggest fan. I, I love everything he does. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan too, Dave. I, I think he looks at things outside the box of what is traditionally okay. And I think that's really important for a lot of players, not just tour players like a Matt Wolf or somebody that's, you know, getting huge ball speeds and is very consistent with it. But, you know, if you're sitting at home right now and you're that player that hits it 190 yards off the tee and never misses the center of the fairway ever when you're out playing. And you know what? You have this perfectly stable golf swing. You never lift your feet up and you don't rotate a lot, but you, you hit it 190 yards straight down the middle. I mean, if you came into a lesson and your goal was I want to hit it 240 instead of 190, we're going to lift your heel off the ground. We're going to rotate more. We're going to get your arms up in the air. We're going to do all kinds of things that might seem crazy. But I mean, honestly, if you hit it another 40 yards and that's your goal, and yes. you know what, even if it goes five yards more offline, you're still in the fairway and that's way better for your golf game than being 190 down the perfect center all the time. Well, so, exactly. And, and, and Mike, you've been, Mike, you've been to our power class and we do our power class where we have students try eight different things, right? And they look goofy and they look crazy. And oftentimes we get gains of anywhere from five to as much as 15 miles an hour in club head speed that no one knew they had. So these things can look abnormal. If you can train them so that you can do them under pressure, then by all means have at them. I love the unusual swings. I've said that before. 
and and I, I I'm all I'm all over, man. I love stuff like that. Yeah, if it makes you more athletic and more efficient, I'm all in. Now, granted, it's not always necessarily easy to tell, but no. you know, if you can find things that make you more athletic and more efficient, I don't really care what it looks like. That's going to be a better thing for your golf game overall. I mean, the one thing I will say, and I know you know, we probably got to wrap up soon, but but you, you got to remember who you're coaching. Number one right? Are you coaching someone that's trying to make the PGA tour and do this for a living? Are you coaching somebody that's just trying to clear the Creek on 12 at 200 yards? Who are you teaching? Are we growing the game and what are we providing? So as a golf coach, I'm trying to educate myself on lots of different methods so that I've got this endless toolbox. And when I bump into somebody that can't do what I ultimately want them to do, I've got another method I can try so that they're happy and they love the game. You know, we're in an unprecedented time right now. You know, we don't know what the golf landscape's gonna look like. As coaches, as students out there, we hope you guys are all gonna come back and play this game. I will say this, golf is one of the healthiest things that you can do. You can get outdoors in the daylight with the wind blowing, you can social distance, you can get rotary speed clinics on a driving range with super speed, you can do your fitness programs on a gym outside, not inside. It could become one of the healthiest things. And I actually think we might seem, I'm hoping, a boom to our sport where people are like, hey, I don't want to be inside a, 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 a trapped area doing my, I want to get out and breathe and be outside. Mm -hmm. Then let's hope that brings them to golf because that would be really cool. And guys like George, they make it exciting and fun. So let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. I think fun's such a big deal. Um, Mike, Kyle, we'll probably try to wrap it up around now. I think that was a great little closing statement in some ways there, Dave, like, you know, talking about what's coming, you know, hopefully we do get back out and play golf really soon. You know, I'm really looking forward to it personally, as much as, uh, as, as with students as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you guys have any questions, um, about TPI, the Titleist Performance Institute, their website is mytpi.com. There's a just huge, vast knowledge base of different exercises uh, and also a great little area right at the top called the find an expert se section. If you want to find these experts in your area, just type in your zip code. It'll bring up uh, golf professionals, fitness professionals, medical professionals that can really do and help you with all of these different things we've talked about today and find the way to best uh, really optimize your golf swing, golf game, and keep you playing golf for a long time. Um, Mike, Kyle, do you guys have anything else you want to add in? Yeah, we tried to get to most of your guys' questions, and there's still some unanswered. If you want to email those to us, info at superspeedgolf.com, we'll do our best to answer those or feed those to Dave and get those uh, fully answered. We tried every uh, everything we could to get them all, but just couldn't get there. Yeah, no, we really appreciate it. But, you know, hundreds of people here watching, um, lots of different stuff. We'll definitely be available. You know, obviously here at Superspeed, we're here to help. We want you to get out there and, you know, bomb it off the tee and have a blast. Uh, Dave, thank you very much for joining us this oh, afternoon. Nice. Really appreciate your time. I know all of us are busy and we're all looking forward to getting back to playing some golf and, you know, really getting back to educating a lot more of the golf coaches around the world, too, with all of this different knowledge. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Stay healthy, everybody.